Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to manage vets consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. This is the uh, bend uh, where we talk about the curveballs that life throws us. I am your host, Debbie Boone. I'm a veterinary practice management consultant. And today I am proud to have Suzanne Cannon with me. Suzanne has a really wonderful story to tell about how she and her uh, life and business partner, Tony Ferrero, started the company Vet Billing. And I remember when they started vet billing because I was one of the people that I guess we had a conversation at the very get go before this started. So uh, Suzanne was exploring pain points in veterinary medicine and we know that money is definitely one of our big pain points. Uh, so Suzanne actually started her career as a pastoral counselor and hospital chaplain. She is passionate about helping veterinarians and pet owners find ways to navigate financial discussions and identify payment solutions where there is emotional safety. She is um, a dog and horse mom, and she actually has otter hounds, right? So if they I have are, one, I have one otter hound. That's enough, probably. That is enough. <laughs> but these are really rare dogs. Am I not yes. right that they are, um, you know, really an uh, almost an endangered species in the dog world because there are not very many otter hounds, and they're really very cool because I see pictures of them online. They are. There's about less than 800 of them in the world. In oh. England, they're considered a vulnerable breed, so oh my we'd oh. love to keep them going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she is uh, an outdoor person. She's a horse girl. So um, she's out there. I, I see every now and then she's got like a beautiful place. She's up in Maryland where she has a great place to run. Not now because she's in the middle of an ice storm and some sleep <laughs> as half the country is covered in snow and ice. And she, uh, oh, I love the fact that you read books simultaneously because I am a, a three book person minimum at the same time. And she said she might be reading five at the same time. Um, she is at the barn a lot caring for Chase or in the saddle, hacking out in the woods. Um, she also likes to roam the rural landscape near the home that she shares with Tony and um, Scott, who is the otter hound, and Finch, who is a miniature schnauzer. Now, is Finch named after Atticus? Is that? Uh, yes, and, and the otter hound's name is Scout, and she's all, she's named after Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird, and we named her that just because she's really not ladylike at all she we brought her home and we thought we were going to give her this really cute girl name and she was like in the mud and clambering up the sides of the stream and I'm like nope this isn't a girly girl we can't give her a girly name like Charlotte or something <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think a very appropriate combination of, of having skin. now you got to buy an Atticus right you got to have yes we do we're saving that for another otter hound a yeah. big boy oh. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, that's a perfect, a perfect otter yeah. name would be Atticus. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Suzanne started vet billing uh, in 2014 when she had experienced um, a veterinary emergency. So I want to start and talk about the um, the bend in the road, I guess, and that got you from being a counselor and a chaplain in the hospital to being a partner in a veterinary billing company because that's quite <laughs> a wrinkle Suzanne that was you know it, you know let's say did you start out in life going I'm going to be a vet billing person you know and when I was a child what was your goal as a little kid yeah absolutely not I I didn't have any I was looking at that question when you sent me the questions to think about in advance I I had no 
real career goal as a child other than to ride horses. If I could somehow have turned that into a career, that's what my plan was. And, um, but already by fifth grade, I was too big to be a jockey. So I had to throw out that idea. So the next option was to be a show jumper or an eventer or something like that. But um, my parents weren't really gonna bankroll that for me. So um, I ended up graduating from high school and kind of following in the footsteps of my dad, studying business in college and working for some large companies in marketing and sales. But then as I approached my 30s, I realized that that wasn't really who I was. I was more of a teacher and helper and encourager type of person. And I was always looking for that angle wherever I was working. How could we be more compassionate? How can we help solve problems? And I went back to graduate school and pursued a master's in pastoral counseling. So that's real. my nature really is to be more of a helper, a connector, a soother, and that sort of a thing. Yeah, I, I, I love the fact that you, and you're not the first person who has said this on the show, I started out in one path, and then I really discovered as I matured that my nature led me to the real thing that yes. I was supposed to be doing, and, and so it's, it is a kind of a shame that at 17, we're supposed to make these life decisions that say, this is what you're going to do the rest of your life, so go choose a course in college, and then go do that. Yeah. And, and you're stuck there from the, you know, from the get-go. Now, most veterinarians do that because I think they choose their career by the time they're between five and 13, I think. Are the yeah. Spots. And I was one of those. I mean, I wanted, I was a horse girl too, though. So uh -huh. I, wanted to, um, I wanted to be equine vet. But then reality set in when I got into school. I do have an animal science degree. And after drenching a few sheep and freeze branding some cows, I decided this was not for me. I was just uh -huh. you know, more like the dog and cat girl. And I love the business part of it. So I came inside. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, we're, let's talk about the big change because here you are, um, you know, and at this point in time, I think you're a physician's wife because you just wrote a blog about this. And this is why I know even more backstory on you than I normally uh -huh. would. Um, what was the big change that led you to kind of the crisis that started a business? Well, they didn't happen back to back. There was, I was working as a pastoral counselor and a hospital chaplain, and I was married to a physician. I had my two schnauzers and yeah, I, I could say everything was fine, but obviously it wasn't fine because then I ended up getting a divorce. <laughs> which was not something that I planned for. Nobody ever plans for that. So that was really the first big curveball was having a marriage come apart when you're in your late forties. And um, right after I got separated from my physician husband, I had to move back in with my mother. So you can imagine that when you're in your late forties, hi mom, here I am with my dogs. And um during that time, one of them got really acutely ill with pancreatitis. And of course it happened on a, late on a Saturday night. So I bundled her up and went to my local pet emergency clinic. And she happened to have a really terrible bout of pancreatitis where she ended up not being stable enough to be treated for the weekend and then transferred to my regular vet. She had to stay at the pet ER. And I had a vet bill from that incident that was about $4,000. So um, now I thought that I had done everything right up to that point in terms of being a, a pet parent. I had pet insurance. I got pet insurance back in the mid nineties when there was only one provider, it was then VPI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I told friends and I actually had people laugh at me and they said, what do you mean you got pet insurance? And I said, well, I had already been through one bladder stone incident, having a schnauzer. And in the mid-90s, that would cost about $1,000. That was tight, but that was doable. And I was married. So after that, that the bladder stone incident got me on pet insurance. Mm -hmm. So I had been paying into a policy for two dogs for already almost 10 years when I had this pancreatitis incident as I was going through the divorce. And what I realized in that moment, I, I still remember like yesterday, standing at the reception desk at the emergency clinic 
at like two o'clock in the morning with this bill of four thousand dollars and i was petrified because i suddenly i had no backup i didn't have anything to fall back on i was alone i was working part-time i was newly single moved in with my mom and that's when I realized my, my pet insurance policy didn't help me in that immediate situation because I still would have had to find the $4,000 and file the claim. I, I didn't have it. And I was so relieved when the client service rep told me about care credit. And I said, oh, okay, well, we'll apply for that. And I was declined. And I was humiliated. I, I felt humiliated and I felt helpless. And your mind's spinning. I was going through all these scenarios. I'm like, well, I can easily get two or three other part-time jobs and, and pay for this. And, blah. and then I realized, well, wait a minute. That's still not going to give me $4,000 right now. Um, you know, it's going to take me time to save it. And, and of course, the emergency clinic said, we, we're, we can't let you do payments. We're sorry. We can't do that. So that was my first introduction into that horror of really wanting your pet to be saved, wanting to pay, but not having a way to do it. And that the only option you had, you were not considered good enough for it. <laughs> I, I was so embarrassed by being declined. What I didn't understand then about that was I was probably declined because I didn't really have any credit history of my own. Mm -hmm. I had been married and all of our credit was in my then husband's name. I didn't have any verifiable credit history. So even though I felt like I'm thinking, I'm like, what, what haven't I paid or what have I done wrong? It was really more probably that there was just no credit there for them to verify. But that was a really rude awakening. And um, it was still many years later that I met Tony, who is now my life partner. And Tony had had a payment management company since 1986 and they do accounts receivable management and payment processing and after we'd been together for a while i said you know i said i wonder if we could adapt what you do since you've already built the infrastructure for payment processing and managing receivables and we could take it to veterinary medicine because i remember being in the situation where i needed something other than care credit to, to get me through a, a tough time and be able to pay. So that that's how I got from pastoral counseling to, <laughs> to vet billing. Yes, yes. Um, and I think that was kind of taking that natural helper, encourager aspect of my personality mm -hmm. that still allows the pastoral counselor to live and channel that into a practical tool that I hope helps pet owners and veterinarians overcome that cost barrier. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that you have always taught, and, and I have listened to you speak a couple of times in our vet partners group, and, and you really enlighten me as to how people, even who have means, who are making 100000 plus a year, still cannot come up with the money sometimes. Yes. That they just don't have an option uh, because they live paycheck to paycheck, no matter how big the paycheck is. You know, right. So I, I think that that was so enlightening to me um, when you shared that. And, and have you got some, uh, just off the cuff, I know you know this stuff, like I know my management stuff, um, stats on how many people are just living paycheck to paycheck? Yeah, we have about 60% about of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And the tendency is to always assume that the people that are living paycheck to paycheck are lower income. And that's actually an erroneous belief that, that many of us have. So there's a really interesting measure of um, the ability to absorb an unexpected expense um, that's defined as financial fragility. And financial fragility is defined as a person would have difficulty coming up with $2,000 within 30 days. Wow. And it's very surprising how many households in America are financially fragile. Yes, financial fragility is a big problem among lower income, but 30% of middle income households are financially fragile and 20% of upper income households are financially fragile. 
So this is not just a problem that's limited to lower income pet owners. And, um, and again, we, we never know what the circumstances are that might lead someone to being in a situation where they just don't have ready access to cash or they have access only to limited credit or maybe they have no access to credit. And we, we often tend to be very quick to judge those pet owners as somehow they must have been financially irresponsible, but we don't know the backstory. It's just really easy to, and our brains like to work in such a way that where there are gaps of information, we want to fill it in with a story. Mm-hmm. And our story is usually negative. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. Human nature. Us look good and them look bad. <laughs> That's right. right the story. I think, I think that makes it easier to cope with emotionally too. Like we, we, maybe we don't feel as bad if we can judge them as having done something mm-hmm. wrong. Maybe it makes it easier. Mm-hmm. But the fact is, is that we just, we don't know the backstory. Exactly. And it could be one like mine where up until that point, everything was fine and paying $4,000 for an emergency bill, I'm not going to say it wouldn't be any problem, but it, it wouldn't have put me, put me in a panic. Right. Um, but my circumstances changed. Mm-hmm. So do we want to tell people, well, you shouldn't have your pet now that you've gone through a divorce or your spouse died, or I think we, I think we're all happier if we, like Brene Brown likes to say, if we assume people are doing the, their best, we feel better about things. And I've always cracked up when I first read that, when she wrote it. I was as outraged as she was when she first heard her therapist tell her that. <laughs> she said she went home and said that to her husband and said, I was like, I know people are not doing their best. Look at that lady that I just shared a hotel room with was awful and she wasn't doing her best. And her husband, I guess, is kind of more laid back guy. And he said, Well, you know, Renee, I kind of think of it like that. And I just don't get as upset when I figure that people are doing the best they can with the resource they have and what they know, then I don't get as mad or upset. Yeah. I, I wrote a blog, oh, it's probably been a year or so, uh, and it was about uh, driving a car. And I said, everybody I know drives a car and they put gas in it and they change the oil in the car and they'll wash it, you know, occasionally and they can look after it but they can't fix the car and right. they don't know how to fix the car. And, and I'm in that same boat. So I'm not going to judge somebody because they don't understand how to take care of their animal because they, I don't fix cars, you know? Right. And so if you're going to, going to look at it like that, well, then you are, you shouldn't have a car. You don't right. know how to repair it. You don't know how to fix it. You don't have to probably maintain it. There you go, right? So don't be judgmental about this. Instead, curiosity is the key to it. And, um, and let's ask some questions instead of why. Um, I was just listening to the Vet Partners Conference and uh, I attended it and we had a speaker there from the University of Pennsylvania who is a specialist in conflict resolution. And I asked him, how do you ask questions without the questions appearing judgmental? And he says, never ask why, always ask how and what, you know, how did, how did you get into this situation and what can we do about it? Not why did you get yourself into this situation? Because that is judgmental. And so I think if we just get always being curious instead of having this furious, (laughs) that we would be much, much better off as it is an entire population you know let's just start to ask questions about why people feel the way they feel and how they're you know how we can do better how can we help other people be uh, and do better so obviously your curveball had to do with um you know becoming a, a divorced woman and a dog with mm-hmm. pancreatitis yeah um, what was the scariest part of that event for you it, it, it was that, that absolute feeling of, ter- a feeling of terror that I had, I felt like the floor was dropping out from underneath of me when I, because I had that sickening realization that where was I going to get this $4,000? You know, where was I going to, what was I going to do? Now, the way that that in, ended up being resolved for me was I was lucky that I have a mother that could help me with that. And then I had to pay her back. Mm-hmm. Not everybody has access to a relative 
that is financially stable enough to help them. And even at that, I had to pay my mom back. And as I was rebuilding my life from a divorce, that was absolutely devastating. I mean, my life completely changed. It took me four or five years to pay off that, that debt um, as I was working to get back on my feet again. So, you know, we end up where we end up and we can't see the road ahead. We don't, we don't know where we're going and we're just doing the best that we can with what we have. But, but that moment, of suddenly realizing that I was that vulnerable and that I love my dog. I don't have children. So my dogs and my horse are, are my kids. And to think that I would have been in a situation where I had to consider economic euthanasia or surrender was untenable for me. I had had this dog since she was 10 weeks old. So I'd raised her since she was a puppy. Her name was Liba, which means love in German. And she was the embodiment of that. And the two dogs that I had at the time too were my main coping mechanisms for dealing with a divorce. They were an emotional support system for me. So the idea of potentially losing them because I didn't have that immediate amount of money right then, um, was was really flat out terrifying because you're you're already worried about your animal's health. What, what you want is you just want them to be saved. You want them to be okay. You don't want to be in pain. And then to have that financial stress on top of that, which is something that we don't quite have when it comes to human health, because most of us have that safety net of insurance. We never even know what the actual total bill is when it comes to our health care. We have a copay. And we might see a bill after the fact where we maybe we have to pay a little bit more because of benefit schedules or something. But it, it's not quite the same as it is in veterinary medicine where we're generally expected to be able to cover the cost out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't work quite the same. So that was big wake up call. And I had never had a veterinary expense that was that high before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, in the fact that you, you know, you had the insurance. I mean, and this is something that, you know, I'm, I'm have long been a fan of pet insurance and having options for people and just enlightening your pet mm -hmm. parents about the options that are out there for payment. But um, even then, because of the way it worked, you still had to pay it all up front and get paid back for that. Right. And, and that was, you know, you're right, back in the old days, VPI was much more like, a, it, to me, it reminds me of an AFLAC policy where you get a mm -hmm. schedule and here's X amount of dollars that you get for whatever thing it has. Yes. And the, of course, you know, we have so many better new options now in pet insurance. But I want to go back to the divorce because one <laughs> of the things that we are talking a lot about in the bin is these, these curveballs that life throw you that you kind of power through mm -hmm. and then looking back on those things did it was it was it for the best did it really change your life for the better but you didn't feel it at the time you know it was really rough going through those things but now that you have the hindsight and you have the perspective of that do you think that your life is better than it would have been if you had stayed married Yes, it is. And you're right. I absolutely couldn't see it at the time. At the time, it was like, I often would think it was like being in a boat that capsized and you were underneath the surface and you could see the light, but you were desperately trying to swim back up to the top and regain your equilibrium and find that boat and climb back in. So I, I felt like I'd just been dumped in, in the water. And so when I was in the immediate moments of it, it was absolutely horrendous. It was the worst thing that I had experienced in my life up to that point. And, um, but years later, when I look back now, it forced me to see that I had resources for coping that I did not know that I had. Um, to tell you the truth, Debbie, that entire year, it was, it was honestly the year from hell because it wasn't just the divorce and the $4,000 vet bill. I also had a, a veterinary crisis with one of, with my horse. And, and again, you would say, well, by all rights, what is this divorce struggling woman doing with her, her horse and her two dogs? I was doing everything I could to hang on to them because they were my world. They were holding me together. 
and my horse heard gunshots. Somebody shot something nearby, scared the horses. He ran through inch thick oak board fencing and fell and he got an injury right over his ankle joint. And it required me to attend to him daily and rewrap his bandages. And I mean, I was struggling to get out to that barn and do this stuff. I, I was absolutely overwhelmed. I was like, when is, is this gonna stop? Then he got a infection from injecting antibiotics and he ended up at New Bolton Center at University of Pennsylvania. It was, it was unbelievable. Even my, my equine vet came out and she's like, I can't really believe all this is happening to you. <laughs> she said, I'm so sorry. But what I've said to people since that time was, if you had told me before that, that I was going to go through all that stuff, I would have flat out said to you, oh, there's, I, there's no way I'd survive that. Like, there, I wouldn't get through that at all. But you know what I did, miraculously, because it's a matter of just putting one foot in front of the other, and you do it mm -hmm. because you have to. Mm -hmm. And I remember when my vet told me about my horse too, that he was going to probably have to be on three or four months of stall rest. And I was appalled. All I could think about was all the work that that would entail and involve for him. And all of a sudden I had this light bulb went off and, I, and it said, oh my goodness, you don't have to do all four months of stall rest at one time. You're just going to take it a day at a time. And it suddenly seemed manageable and not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. yes, it, it changed me for the better because I found out I had strength and resources that I never would have known that I had, which I think is a story for a lot of people that deal with curveballs in their life. Yeah, I think, I think so. You know, I, I remember um, being diagnosed with breast cancer at 46 and uh, many people, I mean, I just kept working. I just kept doing, you know, what I, what I normally did. Um, and there were many of my clients who had no idea that I was going through that. I had a, a wig that pretty much looked like my hair and my staff didn't, I mean, they, they told some clients, which was wonderful because I mean, my clients were, they were friends. I mean, I had been, mm -hmm. I had been working that practice a really long time and people knew me well. And so all the cards and the letters that came and the support from the clients was amazing, but you really don't, think about tomorrow. You just think about, let me get through today. Let me, let mm -hmm. me deal with whatever's happening in this moment. Right. And you, and you can't live in the past either. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's the other thing. There's nothing you can do to change the past. It is what it is. Let it go. And yep. you can't fix tomorrow because it's not here yet. So don't worry about it. Live in the present, do it now. You know, and then I'm not saying don't set strategic goals because I am a goal setting person and think, you know, I, but you know, sometimes God laughs at your plans, right? <laughs> so uh -huh. just that's what your plans are. But you know, it, there's other plans out there that, um, that actually turn out to be okay. So, um, and I, I think this is a theme that people need to realize these dark times are times of struggle. And we go through the valley of the shadow of death. Mm -hmm. But then when we come to the peak of the mountaintop and we really appreciate the view when yes. we get up there. Um, it, it, because if it was all, you know, rainbows and unicorns, you'd never appreciate what you had. You know, you, you wouldn't be grateful for what you, right. have, what you are now. And gratitude makes so much difference in how you enjoy your life, um, no matter what's going on. I, I think that the story that you're telling here, Suzanne, just resonated with me because this past year of COVID has been one year of putting one foot in front of the other yeah. for so many people, and especially veterinary medicine, where nobody expected it to do what it's doing because- yeah you know, as, as businesses were closing, you would think, okay, we're going to have an effect of this. Well, the effect was everybody got a pet and now wanted to come and spend money with us. Right. <laughs> and, and, and teams are exhausted. Um, AVMA stats said the veterinary hospitals all across the United States in 2020 on average were up 7% in revenue. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that is astonishing. I mean, because we're in a pandemic. <laughs> this is not supposed to be the way this works. 
So in, in all my consultant friends are like, we never, never, ever, ever thought this was going to be the way this worked out. No, um, we're, we're all, we were all used to seeing the um, VHMI Insiders Insights monthly reports for years that said revenues were flat, new client growth numbers were down, existing client visits were flat. And, you know, at the outset of COVID, I think we were all thinking the worst, like, oh my goodness, how is this going to, what is this going to really, do to those numbers? Yeah, I kind of really thought it was going to be 2008, 2009 again, you know, right. Well, so many people had lost their jobs that they just quit spending money. And, yeah. and what we saw was in general practice, a, a reduction, but then emergencies went up because people were delaying yeah. care because they didn't want to spend the money. And then the animals were really, really sick. So we saw animals that were the, a lot sicker than we normally would see them during that time. But that's not what happened at all. I think people were working from home. They quit spending money on stuff that they didn't even know they were spending it on, like yes. the Starbucks run and the lunches and shopping it on their breaks. And all of a sudden they had disposable income and nowhere to spend it except the vet. Yeah. And, there, and they did. And boy, did they. Um, but here, let me tell you an interesting stat that is um, that I still I don't I, I can't figure this out. While veterinary practices have seen their revenues go up and they're busy as all get out. They can't even keep up with clients. They're turning away new clients. There's waiting lists. You know, you have to wait a long time for an appointment and all of this. Um, veterinary charities are being absolutely slammed with requests in an unprecedented degree. So people are looking for financial help more than they were before. So I'm trying to understand what is going on with those clients? Are they you know, so somewhere out there, there's pet owners that are still struggling mm -hmm. because some of the veterinary charities can't keep up with the demand. The other problem for veterinary charities is that their donations have gone down because of COVID. Universal, all charities really are. Right. But I think that's a really interesting, I, I think that maybe shows the divide in our country between, or, or sort of the inequalities that are inherent in our system is that while we have some, we have veterinary practices that are, you know, rolling in revenue yeah. and very busy right now. We have veterinary charities that are struggling to keep up with requests for assistance. And um, that was one of the most important things that I wanted vet billing to be able to do was to fill that black hole for the people that maybe don't have access to credit options, but they don't really also need a charity because they're working and they have income coming in. Mm -hmm. They just need to be able to make payments. Mm -hmm. And then that's leaving more of the resources for really impoverished pet owners who really don't have money coming in and they don't have anywhere to turn. Yeah. So that was one of my goals for vet billing. Um, and one of the things we are doing too is we're partnering with some nonprofit charities now like Brown Dog Foundation. Mm -hmm. And so what Brown Dog does is they actually pay the vet up front they approve a grant for the pet owner, they pay the vet, and then the pet owner pays Brown Dog back using vet billing payment plan. That's great. That's great. We would, you know, would love, love to see more charities do that. Yeah, I want to make sure I have that on my list because, you know, I have on my website, and I know you've got, you do too, a, a list I created many, many years ago of the charities that we could send out to a pet owner and ideas about how to finance because, what you said was here I was and I was kind of in a panic right because I my animals were sick I my, my brain was kind of on freeze trying yes. to solve this problem and I think that a lot of people are in that situation when we are especially in emergency uh, clinic and I ran emergency clinic for three and a half years is we need to think for them we need to yes. have tools in place for them so they're willing to do this stuff, but they don't know what to do. You know, they don't know what yes. to do. About. And, and so I, some of the things that are on this list are charities like uh, Brown Dog and the Morris Foundation. And, you know, there's a whole, there's about 30 of them on the list. And then other ideas about crowdsourcing and pawning your jewelry or, you know, whatever thing that you have of value, um, title loan for your car. I mean, those are you know, not good options. I think they're not no. financially wise options, but they're options that make people don't think about in the moment or even calling your boss and say, hey, can I get advance on my paycheck? 
Mm -hmm. If you're a good employee, of course they're going to do that for you. But nobody has the the mental presence of mind in that moment of stress to think along those lines. They're just in a panic, you know, and then the panic yes. often will turn on to the veterinary team is you don't care. You know, you don't care yes. about anything but the money, which if, if you wanted to drive the stake in the heart of a veterinarian, that's the one comment that will do it is to say mm -hmm. you don't care about anything but the money because they don't particularly care about the money. They care about yeah taking care of those animals and, um, and, and doing good for them. So I, I think that you've provided in vet billing a, a, an excellent stopgap in between the two. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody is going to even qualify for vet billing, but at least mm -hmm. you have better options. At least you can say to that client, okay, or to your, even to yourself, these folks are a, a C rating which that's a pretty good option. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to take a chance on that. Yes. That we're going to divide this up into maybe a shorter term, maybe three months period of time rather than, you know, a, a longer period of time. But if they're a D or an E, at least you go into it knowing you're going to get burnt. And, and then you don't send home, you know, $500 worth of medications. You let them say, I'm going to take care of this as, as inexpensively as we can and still get the work done. And still hope for the best that we're going to get, you know, and I think that you guys have really interesting stat that says if we will use your credit rating, there's a really high um, rate of collection. I mean, people pay. Yes. Yeah, we have a very we have very good payment compliance, and I have to say that um, it, we have a, a credit letter grade system that veterinarians can use to help give them some idea of the extent of the risk they're taking on and they can determine whether they want to do that or not. But I have to say that even clients that come up with D and E ratings, we have over 90% payment compliance with them. That's great. I don't really know why. Well, for one thing, what I can say is when somebody comes up with a lower rating in our system, that's equivalent to a FICO score along with some other variables that we take into consideration. Um, some of that may be simply that they were like me standing at the emergency clinic years ago and they don't have credit. Mm -hmm. They might not. So it doesn't mean necessarily they're bad risk and they won't pay. It just might mean that they don't have any verifiable credit history. So you might find that with young people that are maybe just out of college and they haven't been in the job market that long. You might find that with elderly people who don't like to use credit a lot. Exactly. Yeah. And um, but then that one time comes that they need that mm -hmm. for their pet and they're not going to qualify because we can't find a history on them. Vet billing is really for people like that. And also we wanted to give vets the opportunity to capitalize on the relationship they already have with their clients. You know that client. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a long-standing client that you've known, and maybe you do know their backstory. Maybe mm -hmm. you know that they just lost a spouse or something like that. We don't want the vet's hands to be tied because they're not approved for credit to be able to say, we can't do anything for you. We want to be able to give them an option where they feel confident that they're going to get that money back. Mm -hmm. And save that client some grief and stress because honestly we do hear from pet owners all the time that have been given payment plans and they are so grateful and they can't say enough about the vet clinic. Mm -hmm. I mean, they thank vet billing, but it's the clinic that delivered the services. And it's the clinic that offered the payment plan. And, um, you know, they'll say, I just, I, I don't know what I would have done if it hadn't been for this option. Right. And those are the stories that, keep me going on the days when it feels too challenging. <laughs> I remember that we are making differences in the lives of individual people and their pets and we're keeping them together. Well, what, one of the things that I've always liked about this, and I don't want to get back to your story too, but this is such an integral part of your story is that as, as a manager of a hospital, I was the one who always had to talk about money. Yep. And it's never a fun conversation. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. And how to, and having options makes so much difference because it says I'm trying to help. Yes. I really want to help. And I don't want to be the bad guy that just says no all the time. And I don't think, and, and Tony and I have had a conversation about this. Some receivables are okay. 
Yeah. And, and there are just so many managers and practice owners that are so black and white in this that say, no, we should not have any receivables at all. But good debt is okay. You know, mm -hmm. it, it sometimes it is the bond that really strengthens the tie between you and that person. And it's just like you. I mean, if I, if you were my longtime client and I knew you, I absolutely would have split that bill for you into three, four, five options, you know, that were doable for you. And I have done it over the 20 years I managed. I can't even tell you how many times I did it. And, and then if I would do it for you and you paid me in time, if you needed it again in the future, you got it again. If you burn me, you didn't get it, you know. Right. So it was an agreement, you know, there had to be a mutually beneficial, um, part to this agreement and you held up your part and I held up mine. Right. And if you wanted to ever do it again in the future, then both parts had to be held up. But the, the great thing about vet billing is that it's the buffer between the mm -hmm. collection company and the practice, because as also as the manager, I sucked at collection mm -hmm. and people would say, Oh, can I, you know, can I hold a check? And I would go, okay, I'll hold a check for like a month. And then the month would come and they call up and go, can you hold it for like 10 more days? Okay, we'll hold it for 10. And we would have these checks that would have the date marked out four <laughs> times. So if, when you separate it, it's so much easier to say, no, I'm sorry, you have this agreement with this outside company and they're going to pull that out of you. So you better be ready because I can't do anything mm -hmm. about it, right? <laughs> so, uh -huh. I'm, I'm, my hands are tied. I can't do anything. And then they actually will make sure that there's money in there because you really don't have problems with the drafts hitting. Uh, yeah, I know that too. That, And then you're going to call them if the draft doesn't clear. Yes, we, we, we're the ones that are having those conversations instead of the, the vet team. Yes. Because I don't want you to have those conversations. Right. You have we're more important things to do. We're <laughs> really, really bad at it, Suzanne. So it is much better to outsource this stuff. There's many right. things that you should outsource in the veterinary hospital. And collecting billing is, an, is one of the things you absolutely should outsource because I don't know a soul in this profession that is good at it. They just are not right. Good. And, and we don't have the systems either. You know, that's something is to put a system in place that, um, that makes this efficient. Um, so when you, were, when you were doing all this, what was the value of your network in getting this launched, getting this company launched? Oh, well... <laughs> It was, I didn't have much of a network when I started other than fellow pet owners. So what I started doing was talking to them. And once you start this conversation, you find out that many, many people have been in a situation similar to what I was in. And then my next place that I went was my own veterinarians because I had my small animal veterinarian for my dogs and I had my equine vet and then as anybody with horses knows, you never only know your equine vet in the area, you know all of them. Yes. So I called, yeah, I yeah. called all of them and I talked to all of them about how much of a problem is this in your practice? And boy, were my eyes opened by that because I knew as a pet owner that this was a challenge for pet owners, but it took doing research and networking with people. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm getting choked. <laughs> um, it took networking with veterinarians for me to appreciate that this was equally as bad for them um and not even as you're saying not really necessarily because the money part that's important but it was the feeling that it gave them of the bad feeling of you know I don't know where to turn with this and I don't know how to talk to people about it I didn't get into this to talk to people about money mm -hmm. um and and so that's when I was listening to those pain points and I thought I I really believe there's a way we can make this better and then my research expanded from my local area and I got on the internet and I started looking for people and you were one of the first ones that I found um, because you had written some blog posts about it. And there was, you had a, I was going to say paper trail, but we don't have those anymore. An <laughs> internet trail. And, and, and you talk a lot about communications between teams and clients. And I reached out to you 
by phone and you took my call and you talked to me. And you were one of the few people that did in the beginning. And you were so helpful to me because I told you at that point, I was really researching it. We hadn't mm -hmm. even launched anything yet. I wanted to identify the extent of the problem on the veterinary side and how it felt for veterinarians. Cause I knew what it was like from the pet owner side. Um, and you really, you really helped me with that. And um, shout out to, to another vet named Mike Losasso, who's the chief of um, emergency medicine at Frisco Pet Emergency in Texas, where I know they're going through all kinds of crazy things right now. Mike also helped me a great deal in the beginning, um, talking to me about the veterinarian side of things, his perspective of this as a veterinarian and what options that he would like to have seen become available that were not yet in existence at that time. And so, and each person I talked to helped me find another one to talk to after that. Mm -hmm. So the networking was super important in the beginning for me to really, because when I get into a problem, I really want to understand it from the perspective of the person in it. So there's that empathy thing and that helper part of me, that's the pastoral counselor. Like, I want to really get with you and I want you to tell me really what this is like, because the more I know about the problem, the better of a solution that I can help create for you that meets your needs. I don't want to solve a problem that you don't have. <laughs> I, I want to solve a problem that is recurrent and persistent and bothering you. And this is one of those things. Yeah. Well, one of the, the issues, as you know, and many people are, may or may not be aware of in veterinary medicine is that there is a lot of depression, um, a lot of mental health issues. Suicide is, you know, we, we have one of the highest rates of suicide in any professions. And I don't want to harp on that, but I do think that this and what we're talking about is a key component to mm -hmm. that leads to some of the mental health problems that we have, because when you can fix something, you yes. have the knowledge, you have the tools, you have the time, you have the team. And then somebody says, I can't let you do it because yeah. I can't figure out the finances of it. And then they lambast you because they think you don't care, but we don't have yeah. memorials. We don't have grants. We don't have trust like human hospitals do. We don't have government money that comes into us. We are small private businesses. Mm -hmm. And as much as we would love to give away our services and, and do, believe me, we, I'm, I'm the consultant who goes in and looks and sees mm -hmm. how much is given away. Um, you cannot sustain a business that way. You mm -hmm. cannot, we already have staff who are grossly underpaid for the work that they do. Um, and, and we've got to figure out better ways. You know, that's just, yes. we've got to have mm -hmm. these tools in our toolboxes. So having care credit, absolutely. Scratch pay, yes. Um, uh, split it, yes. Vet mm -hmm. billing, yes. Whatever we can do, we need to do it. And I also mm -hmm. believe in, you know, having an angel fund. I love the Veterinary Care Foundation because it enables us to fundraise into our own charity. And then when these situations come up, we can help, you know, we can help. But all that takes, um, you know, a, a, a lot of, I guess it's research. And that's yes. certainly where consultants come in because I do spend my time finding tools for veterinary hospitals to use so that they can do what they do. And, and when they, when that pressure is off of them and they actually can care for pets and there is no greater joy in a veterinary hospital than to have something walk out healthy that came yes. in as you thought had one foot on the banana peel. But when we win, man, we love to win. We do. We're as excited about it as the pet owner and sometimes more so because we yes. do. You know, we knew how close it was to not happening. So if we if we got to figure out how, you know, that's it. We got to always figure out how. And so I, I appreciate you doing this research and coming up with a solution that we can use in the tool belt. I mean, everybody needs multiple tools. And yeah, you know, and it, it, 
it's it's one solution it, it isn't a perfect solution it's not going to work in every situation but i wanted to provide again another tool and i like to kind of say that what vet billing is is it's compassion and empathy masquerading as a financial tool um i i want it to be able to the the compassion and empathy that vets and vet teams naturally have for caring for animals if they know that they have a way to help somebody financially, then they can let that compassion and empathy flow. I think there's no worse feeling than having all of this compassion in you to take action and solve something. And then it gets quashed by the fact that there is a cost barrier. And I, I don't want vet teams to feel that way. It is, as you're saying, it's so heartbreaking for them. It's a huge driver of compassion fatigue, um, depression, and suicidality. So the more empowered we can make vet teams with tools, the better. And um, that that was what I saw vet billing as being. And one of the things that kept me awake at nights in the beginning um, was I used to struggle with, well, you know, it, it's not gonna solve all the problems. It's not gonna fix every situation. And then I remembered um, a quote that comes from the Jewish tradition. And it, it completely changed my mind. It made me keep going forward with this because there were many moments I was on the verge of like, ah, you know, I don't know if this is worth it to keep trying. And the quote says, it's not your responsibility to complete the task, but neither are you free to walk away from it. And I love that because what that said to me was, okay, I maybe don't have the perfect answer. I don't have the only answer, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't try to do something. That doesn't mean I shouldn't throw my hat in the ring with this solution because it's going to help incrementally pet owners and vets. And if it helps one or a few, that's great. If it's able to help thousands, that's great. But that was the difference between me saying, oh, this is just too hard. And, and you know, because it's not perfect, I'm not going to go ahead with it. And I relate to veterinarians and that a lot of them are perfectionists. Yes. So am I. Um, but we can't let that pursuit of perfection keep us from taking action on an idea that we have yeah. because every little bit of good we put in the world matters. Yeah. It's not going to make it perfect, but it does make a difference. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, um, and you're right about the perfectionism and I, I see it a lot in my work daily and I do have, myself a tendency to that you will never get a misspelled email from me because I'm going to double and triple check it drives me crazy if I if I miss a typo but sometimes good is good enough yes true yeah and so just but get it out there and then fine tune it because then you'll find out how to tweak it because until, right. until it starts to move and still it is you start to work with it and see what works what doesn't work Mm -hmm. only then can you can you fix it um that's right yeah there has to be kind of this proof of concept that goes out and then oh yeah okay let's just fine-tune this part of it let's expand this part of it let's ditch this part of it because that didn't work at all and and then we move forward with you know a constantly improving product um right there's no and there's no perfect that goes out into the world and stagnates no and that's you're never done either no. you're never done no. That's one of the hard things about being an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial is that there's part of you that wants to get to a point where you're done. You think you you have it down and you've got the formula and you're done, but it's a constantly evolving, it's a living, breathing thing. I mean, I say that my animals are my babies, but another thing that is like my baby is vet billing. I'm trying to shepherd this into growing into you know some sort of vital solution. And it, because it, a business is a living, breathing entity in a way, it's always changing and always growing. And the minute that it stops is the minute that it dies. Exactly. You're exactly right. And, and knowing, you know, that's, I think one of the things that as a consultant looking in veterinary hospitals, the ones who typically hire me are the ones who it's never good enough. They always want to be better. They always want to improve. They always want to make things better for their team and for their clients and for their patients. And the ones who stagnate are the ones who burn out, are the ones yeah. who say, this is, you know, I, I, I hate what I do every day when I walk in the door. 
And it's because you stopped getting better. You stopped making mm-hmm. an effort to get better and improve and grow as a person. I, you know, looking back on my business, I started it in 2008 in the middle of the Great Recession. <laughs> I don't know if that was wise, but it, it, it happened. Everybody needed help. So it was kind of a good thing. It seems like it worked out for it, you. It worked out for me. Yeah, it worked out for me. But, you know, it's greatly different now than it was when I started. And I, the the subject matter changed. It, it, some of that's still there. Some of the core stuff is still there. The communication, the client service will always be with me because I believe that we are not medical facilities. We are hospitality and we are educators. So when we are hospitable and educate, then we get to practice medicine. It's, it's the tertiary thing that we do. Um, right. So I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, if you put the medicine first, it's so off-putting to the client that they always say no because they don't understand. It's too complicated, you know, so be hospitable, teach, and then do. Right. Do the medicine, yeah. But yeah, you've got to constantly change. You know, you got to, you got to, I mean, if change, if 2020 taught us anything, it is how to change. (laughs) Yes, it did. (laughs) You can do it. You can do it. Some of us would have liked a little less change, a little less quickly. Uh, but boy, did we learn some stuff really, really fast this past year. Right. Well, Suzanne, any, any advice you would give to someone who was looking to make a career change and make a big decision, uh, final words of wisdom that you would share? Gosh, I guess um, just to kind of recap what we were saying don't expect for expect perfection go ahead and and put it out there um don't let your fear that it isn't good enough hold you back this is like me talking to myself like the pot calling the kettle black <laughs> um because a lot of times i hesitate to do things because of fear that isn't good enough or it won't be accepted but um there's always going to be someone that's not going to like your idea um, they're going to think that it doesn't work. Goodness, I, I have heard plenty of that in the eight years since we launched event billing. Well, this can't possibly work. Payment plans don't work. And I'm like, well, this isn't like, it's not your grandfather's payment plan. We're <laughs> taking a whole different approach to it. Um, and then every time you encounter those objections or the non-believers, it gives you an opportunity to refine your messaging and to clarify it for yourself. Well, what am I really doing here? What am I trying to say? Um, what am I trying to solve? So, I mean, it's it sounds cliched, but don't give up. Right. Just, yeah. you know, yeah. don't give up, move forward and learn from I, it. I heard um, a, a quote, and this is really from the, the strangest place possible, but it's from Independence Day, the Will Smith movie. And he Uh says, fear is not real. Fear is something you make up in your mind. Danger is real. Yes. Are you just afraid or is it truly dangerous? And and so when you think about it, am I just being, uh, is this the story that my mind is making up or is it really dangerous to do that? And chances are good. No, it's not dangerous. That reminded me of something someone told me years ago that's a perfect piggyback on the Will Smith's thing about fear isn't real, but danger is. It was when I was working as, as a counselor at John Hopkins, and I was working actually in the AIDS, HIV AIDS clinic, a place where if you needed hope, you, boy, did you need hope in a place like that, especially in the mid 90s. Yes. But um, I had a coworker who I just adored, and she used to run support groups for people with HIV and AIDS. And she said, um, I tell people that I work with that fear is an acronym that stands for false evidence appearing real. Yes. And yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I have never ever forgotten that because I will catch myself in it and go, okay, wait a minute. Is this false evidence appearing real? Or are you telling yourself a story? A story. So I, her name was Ada. I will never forget Miss Ada for sharing that wisdom with me because that acronym has accompanied me for 20 some odd years. False evidence appearing real. So remember that yes. when yes. you feel fearful. When, when you're fearful. Exactly right. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much. We will make sure that 
your information is in the um, uh, description of the uh, vodcast and that people can get access and um, to your information in that billing. And I really, really appreciate the time that you spent with me today. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. And and both of us are such like helper bees. We want <laughs> we want to make things better for the world. So we keep trying, and you know it won't be. We don't have to worry about perfect, but we're just going to keep at it. Right. As, as well, well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate. This was a lot of fun. It, it was a good excuse to catch up with you. So we'll have to do this off of Zoom. Exactly. Exactly <laughs> right. All right. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening again to this episode of The Bend with Suzanne Cannon from Vet Billing.